I just invite you to take a deep breath as we gather a deep breath in, a deep breath out, whether you're beginning your day or ending your day. Enjoy that inhale, hold it at the top for a moment and breathe it out and allow yourself to be centered and grounded in the space that you occupy on the part of the planet in the spinning cosmos in which we find ourselves. Welcome. We are going to be led this evening by two amazing young women, Ana del Castillo and Maya Pace in a practice and reflection around fire salons. And when Wanda and I first envisioned this program theme for REA, we thought a lot about climate grief. What are the practices that religious communities hold, adapt, cherish for holding and dealing with all of the grief that accompanies uh, climate catastrophe, climate chaos, species decline, et cetera. This morning in a session, Dr. Eliana Q quoted Thomas Atig saying, in choosing to grieve actively, we choose to live. So I just invite that as I introduce our guides for the next little bit of time. Anna identifies as she, her, and she is a Mississippian who is of Peruvian and Bolivian and American descent. She is innovating currently at the intersection of justice, politics, and healing. She currently serves as the executive director of Our Own Deep Wells, a movement dedicated to adapting communal practices and individual soulful practices to build mental and emotional resilience. Anna recently served in the Biden-Harris administration as the Deputy Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and Accessibility for the White House. She received her Master's of Divinity as a Dean's Fellow at Harvard Divinity School, where she studied public policy, racial justice, and healing, leading the charge to create HDS's Climate Justice Week. While at HDS, Anna co-created Fire Salons, Circle Spaces for Processing Climate Grief, alongside best-selling author, memoirist, and naturalist, Terry Tempest Williams. Anna dedicates her life to curating experiences for individual healing and collective action, believing that the combination of the two will lead to lasting social change. Anna is a good friend. I met her when she appeared as a guest on my podcast two years ago, I think, and we have enjoyed co-creating and collaborating since then. Maya, Maya Pace, is from the Redwoods of North Carolina and grew up amongst a, a group of people dedicated to community and service. She is currently working as a coach in adaptive leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School, supporting students in transforming the way they affect change and working with the dinner party to facilitate a year-long learning cohort exploring how we build more connected communities. Prior to that, she spent six months traveling across the US as Harvard University Sheldon Fellow, talking to people impacted by our changing climates and about how natural disaster has shaped their relationship to place and belonging. She graduated from Harvard Divinity School with a master's of theological studies after working as the founding chief program officer of Lead for America, an organization that equips young people to build capacity in their hometowns. Maya has a background in facilitation, group dynamics, coaching, peace building, and hospital chaplaincy. And she seeks to infuse her work with experimentation, learning, and practice around the orienting question, how do we live well together? I am thrilled to be bringing these two wise voices into our learning community. Welcome. Um, so welcome everyone. I'm so honored to be doing this presentation with dear Maya. And um, right now I just invite you one as Dory and I talked about, this has been a long day and from what I hear will be a long and beautiful week. So I just encourage you one to hydrate. And if you have 
water near you or a beverage near you, feel free to grab that. Um, and then I also invite you, if you have one, it's totally fine if you don't, but if you do have a candle to bring that near you um, or to go grab one, and we will begin with the lighting of the flame in just a moment. So grab your beverage, grab a candle if you have one. And if you don't, please do not worry. You are invited to, um, to witness the lighting of our communal candle. I love get, watching people get up to go grab their candles. Mm -hmm. um, if you, like me, are in a place where you are not allowed to light candles, <laughs> you can light the candle of your heart. Um, but we are going to begin with, with light. So I'm going to invite Anna to light our communal candle. Mm -hmm. Fire salon was centered around a flame. So we have to begin with light together. And we're going to move into a brief grounding activity. Uh, Dory already primed us for this. But take a moment and place your feet on the ground. If you feel comfortable doing so, you can close your eyes or turn off your camera. And I'm going to invite you to imagine roots extending from the bottoms of your feet down through the floor, touching the soil beneath the foundation, whatever structure you are within. Reaching all the way down until they meet the network of other roots and mycelium, the rhizomatic patterns that are webbing their way all across our soil. Bring your attention up from the bottoms of your feet and the strength of those roots, moving all the way up your body, your legs, your torso, your arms, your head. Just noticing your own body, resonating with the body of the earth below you. And as you do, I want you to invite you to imagine all of the people who have stewarded this land, reaching back generations and millennia, the people and other than human creatures who have made it possible for you to be exactly where you are right now, today. This great group of beings stretching out behind you, holding you close as they hold the land close. Take a deep breath in, let it out. Take one more deep breath in. And as you're ready, you can open your eyes. So Anna and I are gonna introduce ourselves now. And as we do so, I just wanna invite other folks to drop your name and the location that you're calling from in the chat so that we can get to know each other a little bit on this virtual screen. It's kind of disembodied version of reality. <clears throat> It's such a blessing <laughs> to get to stretch the continents together. It is such a blessing indeed. And we have our communal candle lit. And as Maya mentioned, hopefully the light of your heart is lit as well. So thank you so much, Maya, for leading us in that grounding. And so we will begin by telling you who we are. My name is Ana del Castillo. I use she, her, her pronouns, and I am wearing a tan blazer. I have long brown hair and I am wearing um, round black framed glasses. I have tan skin and I identify as a millennial person. 
And I am joining you all virtually from Washington, D.C. on the ancestral lands of the Nacochtank and Piscataway people. And um, as mentioned here, I went to Harvard Divinity School and met my beloved friend Maya while we were students at Tufts University in Boston, Massachusetts. Hi, y'all. It is such an honor to be here. Um, my name is Maya. I use she, her pronouns. I'm wearing a black shirt with buttons on it, and I have long, I have light brown hair. And I'm wearing my favorite big, chunky white earrings that I think Anna gifted to me, actually. <laughs> so I have a piece of her here with me. Um, and I have white skin. Um, as Anna mentioned, and as the kind of essence of Fire Salon um, includes, um, we center our time together around relationships. Um, and so I'm going to begin with our origin story, the story of me and Anna's friendship. Um, and as I do so, I'm realizing I forgot to share where I am with you all. I'm calling today from Totnes, England, um, on the land of the Sharpham Trust, which is um, an incredible piece of land in which the people who are caretaking this land right now are actually working to rewild it. Um, it was recently uh, vineyards, and now it's a beautiful wildflower meadow um, with natural plants um, uh, scattered all around the land. So I feel really grateful to be here for this, this week. Um, but as I mentioned, our time together tonight is rooted in relationships. So um, I met Anna, as she mentioned, as an undergrad at Tufts University. We met and it was kind of um, immediate love. <laughs> we've been friends now for over 10 years. We've lived together. We've worked together. We've dreamed together. We've learned together. Um, and in this time of so much heartbreak um, and so much um, kind of scorched earth and scorched hearts, this friendship is one that I consider an anchor um, amidst all that's going on in this world. So it is really such a joy to get to co-facilitate with Anna tonight. It is such a joy. And I will note that in many ways, Maya has been my teacher around what it means to be a good steward to the earth and what it means to not just love each other and our community, but all living species around us. So I just have to thank her for being my friend, but also a dear teacher. And so we want to just name how we come to this work. And we come to this work, I'm sure, like many of you, with grieving hearts. We're tired. We don't have a lot of answers to how our fellow human beings can choose power and privilege over care for others and how our species can cause so much violence and disregard to living beings. But at the same time, we carry so much joy and hope and we have beautiful community around us and we're in beautiful places. And we know that both the sorrow and the joy have this beautiful dance together and that both can exist. So we come to this work with the belief that healing and confronting the perils of climate change must be done together. And so I put this picture here of Maya and I because we're literally chained to each other. And I think it's a good image to show we are pulling each other into this work because it takes all of us. So I wanna give you a bit of our fire salon origin story. And don't worry if you are still like, what the heck is a fire salon? You will get images and pictures and we will tell you exactly what fire salons are. But the origin story of how this gathering group came to be really begins with honoring our ancestors and the indigenous teachers who came before us and taught us about the importance of communal healing work. So it's so important to provide that context that this is not new work. We are simply following the wisdom that has been taught to us. For me, my ancestors come from South America. I come from the Quechua people and I come from the stories of my grandmother and great aunt who have always gathered um, sometimes around a fire, sometimes not around a fire, but to grieve and to process and to learn and be together. So we know that people have been gathering in circles to tend to the big things facing the world since time immemorial. And to root us in our origin story, I wanted to share this quote that says, the reason why some things feel too big to be felt alone is that they are. A lot of our distress is bigger than one body or one generation. 
we need the alchemy of witness, ceremony, ancestors to feel. And that's by Prentice Hempel. So we have forgotten, especially in our westernized spaces, about the importance of this, of this gathering together. And we have made it nice rather than essential to grieve and build together. Even within soulful and spiritual spaces, folks are more comfortable with individual healing and individual practices than with communal healing and communal practices. And I think a bit of that comes from a fear of vulnerability. It's a lot easier for me to light my candle and do my meditation alone in my comfortable apartment than it is to go reach out to a handful of people in my community to say, let's do this together. But if you were in the previous session for our own deep wells, you heard me talk a little bit about Dr. Lisa Miller, who has really studied the neuroscience behind how spiritual experiences um, really highlight the benefit of building buffers around our brains to be able to deal with anxiety and depression. So we know that there's real brain research that is showing that the benefits of gathering and doing soulful practices um, together. So I won't repeat myself, but that is, um, you should definitely check out Lisa Miller to learn a bit more there. So climate collapse is one of those things that is too big to be felt alone. And the hope for Fire Salon is that we gather together to learn from one another's stories, to grieve together and to move through the despair, apathy and shutdown that will hold us back from doing what needs to be done. So you'll see a picture here of me in an orange shirt standing next to a beloved mentor and friend, Terry Tempest Williams. And um, I had read some of Terry's work as an undergrad. In fact, Maya and I were big fans of Terry's work. So when I got a call that Terry was interested in hosting some sort of communal space um, and a professor of mine knew that I was also interested in doing that, she paired the two of us together and Terry just said like we cannot do this work alone and what the world needs right now is more spaces for healing and for being together and so the origin story is really just responding to what we were hearing at our community at harvard divinity school of you know we don't need another lecture we don't need another resource kit we just need a space to be together so she and i got together um put together a little plan i made this poster and we just said folks come gather us on Tuesdays for one hour by the outdoor fireplace we'll have pizza because if you know grad students you know that we're always looking for <laughs> some affordable or free food and we were pretty nervous like or at least I was nervous I was not sure people were going to come um, and what transpired out of that was truly truly beautiful so this is a picture of the fire mantle where we would gather and this is outdoors um, and what the sights and sounds of fire salon what you might see or what you might smell are individuals sitting outside in a circle near a fire sometimes we had enough chairs sometimes people sat on the floor we were there from the fall winter spring and you know just with all the elements and all the seasons even on the really really cold boston days people showed up with their blankets and brought tea to one another, but we were committed to showing up week after week to be together. You might smell at one of our fire salons, pizzas being passed around, and yes, we had vegan and gluten-free options. And what you might hear is authentic and generous sharing, and you would just witness a sacred community. And I love this picture because you can see the fire, but we also had a guest, um, if folks are familiar with the author, um, an environmentalist, Rebecca Solnit. She came to one of our fire salons alongside Terry and Maya, and this was during the spring of 2023. So what transpired out of this idea to have folks gather around a fire and truly just sit with one another and process the heaviness of the world? And what we found, and really just like the one-liner that I could put on the slide to describe this whole experience is that we were never meant to do it alone. And fire salons provided us with an opportunity to say, we're never gonna do it alone. And now we have each other. And now we have this renewed energy um, that's gonna propel us in the work. And so just to explain a little bit of who these folks in the picture are, this was our first group of fire saloners. So you can see Maya in the back. 
I'm in the front, Terry's back there with her peace sign. Um, but most of the folks who were coming to fire salons were interested in climate change work. So this was a group, we have people from the Kennedy School who were doing public policy and trying to create bipartisan legislation around climate change. We have some business school people that were working on like venture capital around climate change. Um, we also have a lot of divinity school folks that are trying to do what all of us are here um, to talk about, but like really thinking about religious education as um, through a lens of climate change. So I would say the people in this folks all would identify as quote unquote climate people. And what brought us to the space was saying something is missing. We are missing something here. We're doing it alone. We're burning out. We don't feel like a deep tether to the work. And so fire fire salons, I think one of the reasons they were so successful is that we found each other and we were able to be honest about what was missing. So um, yeah, in our human life, we rarely have opportunities to process and dream together. We really don't have moments where we can just learn from one another in a non-academic or non-commodified like commodified context. So I just wanted to share one, testi one testimony from a fire saloner my good friend, Wynn, who came to the fire salons, he was in a joint MBA uh, business school, policy school program, and he had come to Harvard after a career, <clears throat> or a, a, I think it was about five years, attempting to build a bipart bipartisan support for climate justice work. So Wynn had dedicated his career to trying to tackle climate change through policy, he was burnt out from the difficult polarization on climate policies and lack of resources and language to process the heaviness of the realities that we face. So I asked him to send me a testimony for this presentation and he says this, fire salons created essential conversations and connections with a community of support and healing to fuel me in my work. So. What I think is really beautiful is that fire salons offered to people across sectors, be that business, government, science, spirituality, many of whom don't have language or spaces to describe the impacts of climate on the self. So this was an opportunity to say, how is this impacting you? How is this impacting your soul and your spirit? And we found that people wanted that and, and just came continued to come back. And so what I am really proud of and happy about is that we started these in 2021. We're now in 2024 and we have created this lineage. So I, when I concluded my time with the fire salons, Maya stepped in and co like facilitated with Terry, but she made it her own. And so I would love to pass the mic to Maya just to talk a little bit about that lineage. Yeah, it's been it was such a beautiful thing to try to um uh pick up the beautiful torch that Anna and Terry had co-created and think about what it looked like and what it meant to bring that inspiration and the intention of Fire Salon to a different group of people at a slightly different time with a slightly different structure. Um and one of the things that we learned along the way was that um it's really really helpful to have a kind of common touchstone for everyone in the group to um use as a launching off point um, for a conversation. Um, as Anna mentioned, everyone who kind of self-selects into Fire Salon is in one way or another a quote unquote climate person, but that looks so many different ways and people have really different relationships with climate, climate catastrophe, um, displacement, environmental degradation, et cetera. Um, and so one of the beautiful things that was true about the initial iteration of Fire Salon is that Anna and Terry were using a kind of public lecture series that Terry was giving around um, climate change and climate grief. Um, and everyone had gone through a shared uh, viewing of a given lecture before we arrived at Fire Salon. So we had a kind of common text, if you will, um, to, to use for our conversations. Um, in my year, that was not the case. It was a kind of um, group of people who had no shared um, experience to, to touch upon. Um, and so we used a book um, as our kind of common read, if you will. Um, and each week we would select a chapter and read it together and use a question um, to prompt our conversation. Um, the last year that they did this, um, our, our uh, torchbearer Eve um, did a collective art project with the fire saloners. 
And this coming year, we don't know what Josh will do, but um, I'm sure he'll make it his own as well. Um, and so while I'm saying Anna and myself and Eve and Josh, I also just want to note that it was a really co-created space. Um, the beautiful thing about Fire Salon is that um, part of the role of the facilitator is to show up and hold a container um, and really to invite people to use the space how they need, which is both a um, opportunity for a lot of creativity for you as the facilitator um, and also an opportunity for a lot of creativity and agency on the on the part of the participants as well. Anna, if you wouldn't mind, thank you. Um, so we're gonna eventually tonight go into um, an experiential component where we actually get to do a mini fire salon together. Um, we hope that some of you might take this to your own community. And so um, I wanna just build on what Anna shared and kind of narrate a little bit of the thought behind the structure. Um, and you can take what you want from this. And again, it's a very co-created process. So, um, you know, take these seedlings and make them your own. Um, but I do want to just share a little bit about how we've structured fire salons in the past. Um, and again, this has deviated from structure, both again, across semesters and across the years, but also within the, the year itself. Um, and a central tenet of fire salons is that they have been emergent. So while the facilitator has held a particular structure, we have also just allowed what needed to emerge to emerge. So some weeks we entirely threw out the structure and just sat together um, and shared stories and laughed. Um, and other weeks we attended something together. But other weeks we um, we uh, were planning Climate Justice Week. So there's been a lot of different versions of how Fire Salon can look. Um, but some of the core components of the actual time we spend together First is setting the intention. Um, the circle really depends on us having a shared intention together. Um, some of the versions that Anna and I have used are witnessing each other's grief, building solidarity and beloved community together to weather through the storms, both literal and figurative that are present all around us right now. Um, so whatever that looks like for you and for your community, whatever you see the need being, and whatever your participants also kind of want to offer as part of their desire for this space, um, that can all be folded into the kind of rooting intention of the circle. The second, as I mentioned, is the touchstone. So some shared um, uh, text or resource or experience or story that everyone can have access to. Um, and again, I say this because we've, um, I had some feedback once from the person who was very unfamiliar with any conversation around climate saying, I feel like I'm not sure what my place is in this work. Um, and we had a beautiful conversation in which I said, well, um, you know, are there any places that you love? Um, and she said, yes. And so we had a conversation about place. Um, and I think many times people who might not write themselves into a story about climate actually do have a link to climate, of course, because we are all humans alive on the planet today, um, but might need um, more of an on-ramp, a kind of portal into the conversation than just, just calling it a conversation about climate. So having a shared text and a jumping off point can be really, really helpful for people to feel like this is also a group for them. Um, the second thing is, or sorry, the third thing is repetition. Um, as Anna mentioned, we met every week, rain or rain or shine, <laughs> or snow or blizzard, um, without fail, um, for the course of now three years. Um, and I think this repetition was so important because even though the specific group might shift slightly every week, if someone was sick or couldn't come that week, um, we got really familiar with seeing each other's faces. And although we might not know everything about one another's lives because we were coming there for a specific purpose, we began to know um, the sort of flavor of contributions that the people around the circle could offer um, and to listen carefully to what each person was sharing um, and to take one another's perspectives very seriously. Um, yeah, so that was a really beautiful thing just to have that repetition over and over again. And the last thing is community. Um, so again, kind of the emphasis on relationship and to really um, tending to each other. Um, I've met some of my dearest friends through Fire Salon. Um, and though that may not be the case for every version of this um, space, 
I do think the intention to build deep relationship, even if they're contained to the fire salon container, feels like a beautiful commitment to be able to make to one another. And I also just want to note that as I'm sure you all feel and hold and consider, climate grief can be really difficult to sit with. Um, a lot of tears were shed and a lot of um, painful stories were shared. Um, and walking into the space that I think the world is calling us to walk into, which is a renewed space of interdependence, can be super uncomfortable and unsettling. Anna spoke about the vulnerability that is required of us in this communal healing work. Um, and for some of us, especially those of us who may have been socialized to prioritize individual work and either repress our emotions or repress the emotions of other people, this sort of vulnerability can be super uncomfortable. Um, and I also think this can track with people in white bodies, especially in the US, um, though all of us can contain these patterns. And so I just wanna invite those of you who might be considering facilitating fire salons to notice where the edge of your own comfort is as a facilitator. Um, and to know that as we walk into a renewed way of engaging, there will certainly be moments that feel awkward or confusing or uncertain, and that we will need to be nimble and porous and tender and fierce, and that as a facilitator, part of the role is holding the uncertainty and the disorientation, not trying to make it better, but to let it be and to encourage people to walk and rumble with it um, so that we can learn learn how to dance with this new edge that we're all moving towards rather than cling to how things have been. So I wanted to share just a quick version of what a sample agenda has looked like in the past. I won't go through every tenant because I just verbalize a lot of them, but as you can see, all of those kind of core pieces that I just spoke to are present in this agenda. Um, and again, it's looked a lot different at various times, but this is a general arc of what it can look like. Um, I'm going to pause and take a breath. Um, we feel like the best way to share how to build fire salons is just to experience it together. Um, so shortly we're going to break into smaller groups and practice this together. Um, but before we do so, I just wanted to take a moment to see if there are any questions about either the origin story that we shared about fire salons or what they looked like or anything about the structure, um, knowing that you'll get a chance to experience it very shortly. Okay, I'm gonna take that quiet as a sign that folks are feeling ready. Um, so we're gonna move into two breakout groups for the next 35 or so minutes um, to move through a fire salon together. Um, one thing I'll just note is if you need a translator, um, the translators will be in the main room. So we're gonna break everyone into breakout groups, but feel free to pop back to the main room and request a translator to join you in the breakout room as needed. Um, and Anna and I will both be facilitating the two breakout rooms. So with that, I'm gonna open the breakout rooms. Welcome back everyone. Um, I had such an incredible conversation with my breakout room, so thank y'all. And two things emerged there that I just want to share with this group. Um, Vaughn had a great question. Josh, yeah, is it your hand up? Oh, okay, I was like, I love it. Um, but Vaughn had a question of like, how did we choose fire salon? Because I don't know, maybe y'all are more familiar with the term salons um, of like having a salon, but I hadn't heard of it until Terry was like, we should call it this. And I was like, that feels really fancy. I like it. But essentially a salon just feels like a more formal way of saying like, we are a group that will gather together. And the fire came from these conversations about the world being on fire and how could we be close to this force that actually has so much energy and life to offer us and how can we not be afraid of it? So that's where fire came from, but I invite you to call it, it could just be a salon or like a flower salon, a water salon. Um, it doesn't necessarily just have to be the fire, although we found the fire to be really 
lovely, especially because when we started this, this was in the fall semester. So it was very cold. And we it was also during COVID time. So we were like, let's be outside. One of the only ways to be outside is by the warmth of a fire. And then just the second thing I wanted to touch on was the sparklet. Um, and Maya, I think this is your word, which I love. <laughs> so if you want to just kind of explain like what the sparklet means to you or how your group talked about it, that would be great. Yeah, um, I didn't use that language in my group, but one of the things we did as a final go around often in fire salons that we're going to do a, a little taste of here in the big group is um, what's one thing you're taking with you, a phrase, a word, an idea, something that's um, that's with you still um, that you want to take with you. And it's drawing upon um, a sacred reading practice called Florilegia, which is when you read a sacred text, you pick, you can pick one little phrase or line that kind of jumped out at you. Um, and so that's a kind of humanized version, like a, a, a people version, <laughs> as if we are the sacred text that we are reading um, in our fire salon. Thanks, Maya. Well, friends, I know we are nearing the end of our one and a half hours together. So we're going to aim to get everyone out of here in the next seven minutes. And so I wanted to just call us back together and see if we could get two to three people to share what Maya just explained, your sparklet. Maybe it's a phrase that someone said or a feeling that you had in your body, but what are you taking with you from this session um, out into the work that you're doing in the world? So um, please feel free to come off Zoom and we'll get a couple of volunteers or not off Zoom, off mute. I want to share something that one of our members who had to leave said, um, but it ended up being a theme kind of across our group. Um, she said one of the calls for what she's being asked to do with her time is love, which is frustratingly nonspecific and only shows up in specific ways. Um, and one of the th themes of our group is like, how do we work with big things like love or death and dying um, and hold it with a lot of specificity? Um, even as we kind of allow ourselves to be swept in the magnitude of it too. Um, so I'm going to be sitting with that interplay between big and small. Well, I'll share in our, our group when we were talking about what is sacred, um, I believe this might have been Elizabeth or Lauren. I, I didn't write the name, but someone said, sacredness is our relationships with people. We are linked to others. And so it just seemed like a lot of people felt similar about like relationships or their connection to other people felt sacred. Um, so that's something I'm taking with me. Um, but I, this is the opposite of what a sparklet is, but there's also one other thing I just want to share, uh, which was the question on a place that's important to you. I felt transported to where people were sharing. And so I'm taking with me, um, just images of grassland. Hmm. Beautiful. Any final thoughts from participants before An and I share some final words? I have heard this song, Elizabeth. It only takes a spark to get a fire going. <laughs> I was just gonna one. jump I was gonna jump in to say that one of the things that's interesting to me, a pattern across different spaces is circle sharing. Here in the Twin Cities, we do a lot of that around restorative practices and restorative justice. I mean, that's a, a very um, ancient indigenous space, but it's interesting to me to watch it appear in all these other kinds of languages and spaces. It's just kind of fun to see that emerging. Yes, that's such a beautiful reflection. And 
right? It is such an ancient technology. Like it is, it is like so core um, and has been stewarded by many folks, especially indigenous folks over so many centuries. And it's so, um, I'm so grateful that there's more and more of that type of practice happening as we think about alternative modes of how do we be together? How do we think about justice together? How do we think about how to hold grief? Um, because that practice is essential. Um, the thing that strikes me, can I, am I, can I speak? Of course. Um, I am speaking. May I continue to speak? Um, the thing okay. that strikes me is what a beautiful um, way to do public theology, public ritual. You know, we saw a lot of public ritual during the pandemic and, you know, it showed up. Where to go? Is it still out there? Um, this is just a wonderful offering. Um, and I can especially see, I can imagine young people who, uh, from the earlier session today, you know, we've been talking about the mental health that climate um, despair contributes to the mental health crisis that climate despair mm -hmm. contributes to. And I can just imagine faith communities, um, you know, using this as a way of reaching folks who aren't, um, getting don't have access to other uh, ways to access their grief around what's going on in their world and I'm just so reminded that that grief that the 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 response the despair is not pathological it's a normal response if you're tuned in and listening um and so I'm just appreciative of this model It reminds me of, um, in the, you know, in the tradition, it reminds me of All Saints Day. It's always been very frustrating to me because All Saints Day, you only get to bring the name of the person and they have to have died within the past year as if your grieving has come to an end and as if lighting one little candle and hearing their name is enough when what we really need is all this space that we could offer to one another for free. Um, you know, as communities of faith to, to give space for more and more of the story sharing and the and the pain sharing, which is the way to something different. Mm. Mm. Yes, to that. May we have more and more spaces of uh, time unbound sharing. I just want right, to say, um, I really appreciate this whole process. And it started by talking about um you know, a way to hold grief or share grief, but I didn't feel like in our group, we were that focused on grief, which isn't a bad thing. It was, it was fine. It was that it was like a lot of meaning sharing. And, um, and yet there's, there was sort of a little under like what was sacred to, to you in, in choosing what was sacred, you had to leave behind things, other things you, you had to make a decision. And I also, felt like I what Mary's um, gift to us was to talk about a place that um, shaped her that was not that great and she was it was like a good place to leave because it took her to another place so there was some grief in that but then there was there were some you know good that came out of it and so it was just like there's just so many different ways of in which grief was expressed or you know manifest and and dealt with in a way that was really it's really quite healing I feel like I was processing some grief inside of myself not even realizing it until now as we reflect here so thank you for this opportunity to debrief the process too thank you thank you so much for that Lauren yeah I think sometimes grief needs a sideways glance um, sometimes it needs to be looked at head on and sometimes it needs a sideways glance to be invited to the party. Um, especially when we're new to each other, you know, um, but can take many forms. Awesome. Okay. Well, we are going to close out our time together. Um, Anna, I'm going to pass it over to you. 
Yeah. Well, just thank you so much, friends, for your presence and for your participation in this um, hour and a half together. And just in closing, we invite you to continue to deepen your relationships, um, to host a fire salon if you feel called to, but just to know that we do not do this work alone. And we invite you to hold the hands of those who are with you in this collective work um, of building the better world that is possible. So now Maya is going to close us in a blessing. And rather than blowing out the candle together, I invite you to just linger in the light as long as you need to after this meeting um, and to take care of yourself and to rest well this evening. Um, thank you, Anna. Um, as we close, a blessing. I'll note that one of the lines, the last line from this comes from a dear mentor of mine. Um, Feel free to close your eyes or soak this in however you, you wish. May we find it within ourselves to grieve that which we have lost. May we find it within ourselves to steady our hand. When we want to wound, may we instead find the strength to ask, where does it hurt? May we hold those close who are unable to do so. May we bless our fear. May we love our dead. May we love better than we have been loved. May we love. Thank you all for this beautiful time together. I feel so moved and energized by everything that you all have shared. And there's so much I'm going to be carrying with me. Um, feel free to drop any last words in the chat. Um, Anna's putting her website, which is worth a look. Um, and yeah, just thank you all so much for this beautiful space. Really, really appreciate it.